On this week's episode, the story of the Boston Irish mob, the IRA, and the fishing vessel Valhalla. Welcome back, everybody. It's the weekend, so I've got another great tale from the Boston underworld for you guys. This week, it's about the Boston Irish mob and their connections with the IRA, a.k.a. the Irish Republican Army. And this one is especially exciting to me. I've wanted to do this video for a long time, pretty much since I started the channel, because this story includes my hometown, the city of Gloucester. So a big part of the story takes place in my hometown of Gloucester, which I'd always get excited when I'd be reading in a book and I'd see them reference the Valhalla, and Gloucester would be black and white because not much happens in my hometown. It's kind of boring here. But the majority of the characters in this story hail from South Boston, and I titled it Boston Irish Mob, which is a media term. There was no actual Boston Irish Mob. There was no... Irish uh, godfather that all the Irish American criminals in the city of Boston paid homage to and kissed his ring. That's where the Irish differ from the Italians and the Cosa Nostra with their structured hierarchy. There was, you know, capos and bosses and underbosses. There was crews and there was, you know, sometimes like set leaders of these crews. But like I'm saying, there wasn't one Irish criminal that was the godfather of all the Irish criminals in the city of Boston. It just wasn't like that. They sometimes, the media likes to dub Whitey like it, like he was. He was. I mean, he was like the boss of Southie, the godfather of all the Irish criminals in the city of Boston. He was undeniably the boss of Southie. He extorted anybody who was making money illegally in the neighborhood of Southie. But he wasn't the godfather of all Irish criminals in the whole city of Boston. It wasn't like that, like I'm saying. So Patrick Nee, let's give let's backtrack here. Let's do a little bit of history. I made videos before about the conflict uh, in Southie, but it's kind of imperative to how this whole thing shapes up. So Whitey went away in the late 1950s. He went to federal prison, uh, Levensworth, Alcatraz, numerous facilities. He missed out on the whole conflict between Winter Hill and Somerville that kind of reshaped the underworld in the city of Boston. I've talked about this countless times in, in past videos. The underworld was completely different in Boston. Why do you miss all that? So he was kind of like a nobody uh, in the 1960s. He came back to Southie, which Southie was real small time. It was a backwater. Uh, you had the Colleen brothers running the rackets out of the Transit Cafe, which was like a dive bar on West Broadway in Southie. Small scale loan sharking, bookmaking, bets on uh, dog races and the horse races from Suffolk Downs and Wonderland. I don't really think they were much involved in uh, sports betting. They ran numbers rackets, but like I'm saying, real small scale. They weren't even like under threat by the Italian mafia. They weren't trying to like muscle in and get their cut or anything like that. Southie was like I'm saying, it was a backwater. It was real small scale racket. So when Whitey got out, he started working as an enforcer for them. And their main enforcer at the time was this guy, Billy O'Sullivan, who was a legend in Boston, notorious tough guy. Meanwhile, while this is happening in the 60s, there's a group of young guys called the Mullins, and they're starting to emerge in Southie. Um, they're starting to push up into the Colleen's. Their main thing is truck hijacking, pilfering the waterfront. They were in, like involved in like high stakes, large scale thefts where they would back trucks up against uh, warehouses. Pat Nee talks about it in his book, A Criminal and Irishman. They'd cut holes into concrete walls enter the warehouses at night, empty all the contents of the warehouses into trucks, drive off, people would show up to work the next day and the warehouses would be empty. So by the, by the late 1960s, these guys, who a lot of them were like Vietnam, Patrick Nee was a Vietnam vet, they start having beef with the Colleen's. Uh, there's a fight at a bar, guy gets his nose bitten off, and when they go to have a peace talk after this happens, 
the guy Billy O'Sullivan, who's like the notorious, the notorious tough guy from the city of Boston, he ends up shooting one of the Mullins, and it breaks out into open warfare after this. So they're out uh, in the streets of Southie hunting each other. They end up, the Mullins end up catching up with Billy O'Sullivan, taking him out. They take out Donald Colleen, the the head of the crew, the the like the head of the this I think three brothers, but he was the boss of them all. And then his brother Kenny, who was like number two, they end up trying to take him out a couple times, and then they end up just driving by as he's walking or jogging in South and say, Kenny, you're done. You go. So Whitey's on like he's on an island. He's screwed. He's he's on the losing side of this war. He really has no connections. He wasn't like as people think of him today as white balls. Like I said, he was kind of a nobody at this time period. When he came out of prison, uh, he wasn't, he didn't make a name for himself in the 1960s during the conflict between Winter Hill and Somerville. So he reaches out to J.R. Russo. It was like his only contact in, in Cosa Nostra. He ends up getting a sit down with Howie Winter at Chandler's, this notorious hangout in the South End. Uh, he works out a deal. Patrick Nee is there and they're going to split Salty down the middle basically, which I don't know how he worked out such a good deal. He's not coming from a position of power in this negotiation, but he ends up getting like an even split on the Southie Rackets. And because of the fact that Whitey is much more interested in the Rackets and has experience working for the Cleans, I don't really think Patrick Nee uh, had any experience with like traditional bookmaking and loan shocking. He, I don't think he had any interest in those Rackets. Obviously, he wouldn't mind taking his cut from the proceeds of it, but the day-to-day -day working of that... I don't think he had much interest in it. I don't think he really maybe didn't even understand like how the how the day-to-day -day workings were. Those guys, the Mullins, were into hijackings, high-scale robberies, like jewelry stores, warehouses. Um, that's their stuff. They were in, they, they were totally different, you know, completely different mindset. So Whitey, the whole time, he wants to be boss of Southie. He, that's what I, you know, his whole objective was to be the boss, to be the number one, to be like the godfather of Southie. So he weasels his way in there through this negotiation on the losing side of the conflict, gets an even split. So whatever your personal feelings are about Whitey and all the awful things that he's done and the fact that he was an informant, you really can't help but to respect the maneuvering that this guy did during this time period. He's coming from the losing side in this conflict in Southie. He maneuvers his way through this meeting to not only get an even split of the Southie rackets with Patrick Knee, which is ridiculous, that the guy who's on the losing side, who has really nothing to back him up, gets an even split, but because the fact that he wants it more and he's more experienced in the rackets because he worked for the Colleens and saw how this worked day to day and Patrick Knee really could care less, he ends up really just taking control of the rackets in Southie for himself. Now he's an official member of Winter Hill he gets like an even split of stuff that they do. Uh, he ends up clicking up with Steve Flemmy as a be, as becoming a member of Winter Hill. He starts hanging around with Steve Flemmy. They click up almost immediately. Uh, the guys notice when they're at the garage at Marshall Motors, Winter Hill's headquarters, that those two guys are off always doing their own thing, talking, whispering. They had little idea back then that what they were talking about, what they had so much in common was that they were both top echelon FBI informants. I bet those guys wished they could have known that. You know, beforehand, but in 1979, uh, they had this guy, Tony Shula, who was a race fixer, and they were fixing horse races up and down the East Coast and making a lot of money off it, but he got caught, and he turned uh, evidence to the FBI. He's working with the FBI, and he ends up putting a massive indictment on Winter Hill. All the guys get indicted. They get sentenced and go away. The ones that don't run off on the land like John Mortarondo, J Jimmy Sims, Joe McDonald. And the only two guys who weren't on the indictment who don't end up going to prison or going running away on the land are Stevie and Whitey. Now how nobody in Boston was like, this is not right. Something's wrong right from the get go. Um, I don't know how nobody called, like pulled their card on this, but that is how they end up basically consolidating all their power. Before this, Whitey was a nobody. So he ends up maneuvering his way into from being on the losing side of this conflict in Southie, getting an even split because of certain circumstances. He takes control of Southie. He becomes a, a member of Winter Hill through other circumstances. Now he's consolidated everything that Winter Hill had and now he's basically sitting pretty. Winter Hill was the second most powerful entity after the Irish conflict in the 1960s behind the Italian Mafia. So now Whitey and Stevie are sitting on this little 
empire that went to hill is built up and they have the south iraq it's all to themselves and patrick knee could really kill less because he's getting his cut from from like the bookmaking the loan sharking that's going on they're giving him money and basically why he's just paying him off to stay out of his way and stay out of his business because whitey's had this master plan the whole time so like i said you can hate whitey you can say all the nasty things you want about him but i mean you gotta kind of at least i don't know respect is the right word but this is some serious maneuvering here, you know, serious power plays. So throughout the 1970s, much to uh, Whitey Bulger's pleasure, Patrick Nee is becoming less and less interested in the rackets in South Boston. He's becoming more and more concerned and interested in the conflict that's going on in Ireland between the IRA a.k.a. the Irish Republican Army, and the British government. In the 1970s, this conflict was really ramping up. Um, so basically, the IRA, they what they needed was they needed contacts in America, primarily the American underworld, like Patrick Nee, who was sympathetic to their cause, and they needed help arming their army. So I've been watching some stuff about it and researching uh, you know, the struggle between the IRA and in the British government for, you know, while I was doing this video. And I found out that, you know, a lot of the media like to dub it, they like to call it the troubles, you know, and IRA members, they don't like this because that's insinuating that it was like a conflict between civilians, one civilian group, like the Catholics, another civilian group, the Protestants, and it was conflict over this. But they say, no, this was a war between two armies. The Irish Republican army sees themselves as an army. Um, but the problem that they had was it is incredibly hard, difficult to obtain weapons in the UK. The laws, the culture, just societal, it is completely different over there. I remember when I went there when I was younger, I think I was like 11, I went to England. And it is, it just, it's so much different than America. Like the, it's, the laws are stricter. Uh, people just, they don't, it's just the whole mindset's different. So it was incredibly hard for them to obtain the weaponry that they needed to arm an army, that they saw themselves in an actual army, they wanted to arm themselves and be ready to, to wage war against Britain. You know, they wanted to unify the island to Ireland, they wanted the UK out, um, and they needed people like Patrick Nee's help to do this because they were not able to obtain the weaponry to arm an, an army the way they wanted to. So, this has become Patrick Nee's main purpose in life. He's putting 100% of his energy and time into helping the IRA in their endeavors, um, all his armed robberies, heists, anything that where he's funneling money, his cuts from the South Iraqis, he's funneling into acquiring weaponry or just giving it to the IRA so they can help with whatever they need in their fundraising for their war chest. He's trying to get other Boston mobsters like Whitey Bulger and Joseph Murray in on the cause. And his boy Joseph Murray from Charlestown. Now this guy... I made a video about him before, not that many people watched, but he was one of the biggest narcotics traffickers, not just in Boston, um, in America, like certainly on the East Coast. This guy during the late 70s and early 80s was bringing in not pounds, but tons of the green stuff, like so in depth the, with the smuggler I'll talk about a little later in the video, like when they got caught, the levels that they were going through. Like this guy was just one of the best smugglers and traffickers um, during that time period for sure, probably in history. But Patrick Nee was trying to get these guys more passionate and psyched about it because they were making certainly Joseph Murray. I mean, Whitey later, Whitey wasn't really ever generating money from stuff that he was doing. He was just taking other people's money, like guys like Joseph Murray and stuff who were making a lot of money illegally. Whitey was extorting them because people were scared of them. But this guy, uh, Joseph Murray, he was a millionaire over and over and over again. And this is back in the 70s and 80s when not that many people were millionaires. This guy had a lot of money. He was a mover and a shaker. So Patrick Nee was very close with him and he was trying to get him more involved and more passionate so he could, you know, help the effort. So like I said, Patrick Nee is going back and forth to Ireland. He's into he's a hundred percent into this. This is what his life's purpose is about. He's making connections with people who are high up in the IRA because he himself, Patrick Nee, like I said, is Irish born. So it's easy for him to make connections with these guys. And one of the guys he makes connection with is Joe Cahill, who actually not only is he like a top tier member of the IRA, but allegedly I guess he's one of the founders of the Irish Republican Army. So he's meeting with Joe Cahill. They end up getting Joe Cahill to come over here because he says, you, you know, Tyler Patrick Nee, you got to get 
uh, these other guys, you know, the other criminal friends and mobsters, you, you got to get them fired up about the cause. We need their help. You know, we need their money. Uh, we're, you know, we got to win this war, you know, and he's trying to get them. So he's like, Patrick Nee realizes if they can see this, this is the real deal. Like they love to talk about this stuff. Like back in the day it was huge in Southie bar rooms and Charlestown bar rooms and these real tough uh, Irish blue collar ethnic neighborhoods. They would love to talk about the IRA and the cause and get people get fired up about it as they were drinking. And so Patrick Nee knew if he could somehow get this guy, Joe Cahill into Boston and to meet Joe Murray and Whitey Bulger and other criminal stuff, if they met him and talked to him then they would feel just as passionate as he does and they would be all in as well. So they go through this, Obviously, he's a well-known IRA. He's one of the founders. They can't just bring him into America. He'd probably be arrested on site. I'm sure the British government wants this guy. So they bring him into Canada. Uh, he's in Montreal. And under the guise, I guess there was like a like a guy, a, like a bus trip that went to a hockey game in Montreal. And it was like a specific, like, uh, this bus was just for this hockey game. So And it was a shuttle from Montreal and back to Boston. And they smuggled him in, in Montreal, onto the bus and said, you know, that he was just one of the hockey fans that came up on the bus trip, even though maybe, like, it was like, who the heck is this guy? He didn't come up here with us. But they smuggled him back on and said he was just part of, like, a hockey fan that went to watch the hockey game. They smuggled him into America this way, through Montreal on a bus, and he got into Boston, and they bring him to the bar, and they have, you know, Whitey Bulger, Joseph Murray, other guys who are important movers and shakers that are Irish-American criminals, and he shows them like this IRA propaganda film, I guess, and like, like it's like a scene out of a movie. He he, I guess he clicked like the stop button on the old VHS, and he turns around with his arms. Oh no, he had his hands folded in like a prayer form in front of him. He says, "Lads, we need your help," and that's all he needed. They were sold after that. What can we do for you? Now, this guy Joe Cahill is. Very good at what he does. He's a recruiter for the IRA. He gets people to physically join their army. He gets people to contribute, whether it's financially or weaponry for their arsenal. And he has this performance that he gives in front of these Boston guys. And it gets the the effect is, is what he intends to be. He gets people who are on the sideline, like Joseph Murray and Whitey Bulger, and he gets them into the game. Um, they're not, you know, contributing like Patrick Knee and his little performance um, just pushes these guys into action. And Joe Cahill, like I said, he's a very important guy. He worked as a recruiter, going around making speeches, getting people pumped up, like pushing the propaganda of the IRA to keep their, um, their war going. But he was also one of the main commanders in the army. And later on, he would be appointed by the Sinn Féin, which is one of the largest political parties in Ireland as one of the key facilitators when the peace talks would happen decades later. So this guy was just a very important guy. So these Boston guys met him. They smuggled him into Boston. Great story. You know, put him in a bus with a bunch of hockey fans coming back. I, I would assume from a Boston Bruins game in Montreal, I'll put that little picture of Patrick Louar up there. I don't know if anybody caught that. He was a great goalie. I know Canadians suck, but he was a great goalie. <laughs> but uh, they smuggled him into Boston on the bus full of hockey fans. He gave this great speech. Um, the outcome is what they intend it to be. He gets these Boston guys all pumped up. He pushes them into action. And what ends up being the result is they put together one of the largest shipments of arms ever to be sent across the ocean. So shortly after the meeting with Joe Cahill in 1984, the Boston guys get to work putting together the biggest shipment of arms ever sent to Ireland and aid the IRA against the British Army. Uh, Patrick Nee is spearheading this endeavor. He has the experience. He's been working with the IRA for years. He knows what they need. He has a long shopping list of arms. Um, just everything you can imagine the IRA needs. They're in a legitimate war. They're trying to um, uh, supply an army. And Patrick Nee and these Boston guys are, you know, they're happy to help. Joe Cahill got them all fired up. They're passionate about it. Patrick Nee is like in charge, like I'm saying. He's spearheading this. Joseph Murray is basically, he's contributing financially because this guy's got so much money from um, his 
very lucrative traffic trafficking operation that he's running but also he's got tons of smuggling contacts to get his substances into america and to his customers he has to use a big smuggling network so he's in contact with captains uh, crews of ships he has all these contacts in the smuggling world so they're looking to him for the finances and through his connections in the smuggling world that he's already using uh, and it's not caught it's very very lucrative narcotics trafficking operation that he's running that is you know it's a worldwide operation he's got contacts in europe south america asia uh you know this guy he was big time joseph murray he just was under the radar you know so they're contacting they're, they're tapping him for these resources patrick knees basically like i say is running the operation and whitey bulger is collecting a lot of weapons um He's putting money into it. He's shaking people down, basically. He's not, I don't know how much of actual Whitey's money he was kicking in, but he was definitely shaking down. He was making other people contribute money, basically wasn't really giving them an option, you know, telling them what was going on. So by the time that they're ready to make this um, shipment, they have collected over seven tons, seven metric tons of assorted weaponry and explosives and uh bulletproof vests and just a, so anything you could need to wage war uh, against the country S over seven metric tons equaling over the the worth was over a million dollars which in 1984 I, I don't even know what that would be considered in today's money maybe 10 million or something with the inflation we have now but the, it was by far the large like i said the largest shipment of arms ever sent over to ireland uh, to aid the ira in the history so this is the part of the story that I've been waiting to talk about. The boat that they were going to use to smuggle this giant shipment of arms over to Ireland was going to sail out of the city of Gloucester, which in 1984 was still one of, really, not just Massachusetts, was one of America's busiest fishing ports. Uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts is America's oldest seaport, guys. We just celebrated our 400th birthday 1623 to 2023 just saying put some respect on our city come on so they picked um i i assume that joseph murray or patrick knee they knew they had to know robert anson bobby anson this guy who was a captain the gloucester guy uh he was living in rockpool at the time but he's from gloucester uh, they must have known him i don't know if joseph murray was working with him before they were they knew John McIntyre, and I think John McIntyre may have worked uh, before as an engineer and just a crew member for Bob Anderson, and, and Bob Anderson had made some runs because I'm not trying to put any uh, shade on my city or anything, but back in the day, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Gloucester was notorious as a smuggling port. There wasn't just fish coming in and all these fish boats. There was smuggling and a lot of stuff. Gloucester has been known as like a drug city for a long, long, long time, way before there was an epidemic across the whole country. And a lot of these guys um, that made a lot of money in this time period, some of them did it legitimately catching fish, but a lot of guys were bringing in extra stuff and they got money for it. And there's actually a street in Gloucester in my city that uh, is named after the Peruvian marching powder and it's called you know the actual word for it that I can't say on YouTube and that rhymes with lane so they call it that word lane and I actually just took my kids up there trick-or-treating this is one of the best neighborhoods in Gloucester to go trick-or-treating and they go all out with the Christmas lights it's not like it used to be back in the day when I was a little kid in the 80s and 90s the houses were like so gaudy up there and they used to like I remember one year they put like a uh, school bus full of like mannequins that had all the christmas lights they used to just go all out but all, it was always rumored around town that a lot of these guys made their fortunes you know from smuggling in extra stuff in the fish and that's what happened here these guys um i assume that joseph murray like i said he had all these connections in the smuggling game he had you know crews captains uh that was on his payroll that he was working with and john mcintyre had been working with him in his smuggling operations before, bringing stuff into the country. So they tapped him and Bob Anderson happened to be, unfortunately, the captain of the ship of the Valhalla um, when they you know, packed it up to sail it out of Gloucester. So in September 1984, Bob Anderson, the former captain of the fishing vessel Winter 3, and this guy was a good guy. He was a good fisherman. He was respected in the fishing community. He was a lifelong Gloucester guy, people liked him. They say he was a good guy. He wasn't a bad guy. He just 
like I said, a lot of these fishing guys, they would get approached by people that were on the other side of the fence. They were trying to, you know, make connections with people who own boats and see if they could make some, you know, all, you guys can make some easy money. We just need you to bring some stuff in, you know, get some stuff on load to your boat offshore and just bring it in with the with the fish, you know, and nobody will ever know. Uh, a lot of these guys got involved with people in the underworld, and unfortunately, somehow, some way, Bob Anderson came into contact with these guys, started working some way, somehow. But um, people close to it say that he really didn't have a choice. You know, they asked him if he wanted to do this, but if he said no, most likely he probably wouldn't end up disappeared because they would have probably taken that as, you know, this guy is a problem. He could be a loose end. Um, they would worry about him. So the fact that they asked him, it was really an afterthought. I mean, the guy really didn't have a choice. What was he going to do was say no. So he ends up September 1984. Go to the Marine Railways uh, at the end of Rocky Neck and Gloucester. He fuels up with 8,000 gallons of gas. He gets 30 tons of ice, 7,000 pounds of squid and mackerel at quality seafoods. Puts that on top of the seven tons of weapons that they're shipping off to the IRA. And he steams out of the Gloucester Harbor. Just like in any other swordfish trawler. You guys have seen Perfect Storm, and if you haven't, I will be extremely offended. Uh, the boat in that movie, the Andrea Gale, that sunk was a swordfish trawler as well. And sword fishing was a huge industry, and that's what the Valhalla was supposedly going out to catch, but they weren't intending to fish whatsoever. They were going to make a drop off an island. Shout out Mark Wahlberg. Just saying, guys, in case he's watching Perfect Storm, one of the greatest movies ever made. But, um,. So Bob Anderson, unfortunately, like I said, this guy, he got roped into this. He probably wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but because of connections that he had, whether it was through John McIntyre working on a crew with him and having him as a crew member, or if he was working on Joseph Murray's payroll, I don't know. Like I said, the guy was well-liked in the town. Probably felt like he had absolutely no choice. He had to say yes. They steam out of Gloucester Harbor on their way to complete the mission of the Biggest arsenal ever shipped to the IRA in the history. So in September of 1984, filled with fuel, ice, bait, and most importantly, over seven tons of assorted weapons, the Valhalla steams out of America's oldest seaport, captained by Robert Anderson and the engineer and crew member John McIntyre, and it sets sail for international waters to meet up predetermined destination with the Irish fishing boat, the Merida Ann. And the Merida Ann was similar to the Valhalla. It was an Irish fishing boat that was just going out on a regular fishing trip like it did regularly. Um, but the crew had IRA members and IRA sympathizers mixed in. And they were, like I said, going to meet the Valhalla at a predetermined location in international waters to make the switch and get all the weapons off the Valhalla onto the Merida Inn and then they were going to go proceed to bring the weapons into Ireland and give them to the IRA and the Valhalla was going to steam back to Boston and then eventually back to Port and Gloucester. But what they didn't know was they were being watched the whole time. And I'm not talking about Whitey Bulger up on Portagee Hill in Gloucester watching the boat getting loaded and sailing off. As they said in Black Mass that he was on some hill in Gloucester watching the boat get loaded up and sail out of, out of Gloucester with Kevin Weeks. I can only assume he was up somewhere on Portagee Hill, you know. But it wasn't, this is not what I'm talking about. The federal government was watching them, U.S. Customs, the Irish government, the British government, because there was a cooperator. And it wasn't Whitey Bulger telling his pal John Connolly, as some people would think, that Whitey Bulger tipped him off and to get big points with John Connolly and FBI. It wasn't John McIntyre, who was a crew member of the Valhalla, who would in the future end up working with the authorities. It wasn't on the American side. There was a leak in the IRA camp. There was a leak out of Ireland. It was a senior member of the IRA, this guy, Sean O'Callaghan, and he was working with the British M15 secret police, and he was giving them all the dirt. They knew all about the Marita Ann. They knew that they were going to go meet the Valhalla. They knew all about the shipment. It was doomed from the beginning. They never had a chance. This guy, Sean O'Callaghan, he was a big member of the IRA. Like I said, he was a senior member. 
He's a colorful character. He was supposed to do life in prison for two bodies that he caught in 1974. He also killed someone who informed on the police about him. And he himself becomes an informer later in life. So I think that's kind of ironic. But he ended up getting out of prison. And uh, he was very disillusioned with the IRA. And he dropped out in 1974. But then somewhere in between, he decides that he wants to get revenge on the IRA. He decides the best way to do this is to rejoin, become an informant, and destroy them from the inside. So that's what he does about five years later. I think it was 1979. He rejoins the IRA for the sole purpose of bringing them down from the inside and working with the British government, which is like one of the worst things in Irish culture you could possibly do to work with the dreaded British, try to bring down your Irish brethren, um, like just unthinkable in the IRA in an Irish culture. He claims that the IRA hired him and gave him the contract to kill Princess Diana and Prince Charles at the Dominion Theater in London in 1983. This is a pretty bold claim. This guy... He was quite a character, like I said, but his main incentive, the main drive for him selling out the Marie to Anne was that the crew member on the boat was a guy who was a senior member in the IRA. He would become a senior member in the future. He would also become very big in the Sinn Féin political party. And this guy's name was Martin Ferris. And Sean O'Callaghan hated this guy. He detested him. He was like his arch rival and he knew that he was a crew member on the marine and and he had a lot to lose he was a rising star he was like the leader in his region in his area uh in ireland and the ira and sean o'callaghan um he says that he wanted to take him down especially speaking of martin ferris because martin ferris was one of the biggest recruiters in the IRA at the time and he was recruiting lots of young guys and he was getting these people to throw like in O'Callaghan's words he was getting these young Irish guys to throw away their life for this cause that he didn't believe that O'Callaghan didn't believe in and he just detested Ferris and he thought that he was just like the worst of the worst uh whether or not it was a more personal reason than that and he was just using that as an excuse and saying like oh I detest him because he was ruining all these young men's life by getting them to you know destroy destroy their lives and join the IRA and throw their lives away for this cause. Whether or not that's the actual cause or if it was something more personal, he detested this guy. And I think this was, most people believe this was his main drive for setting up uh, the Marita Inn and giving the British police, the M15 secret police, the information to take the Marita Inn down. The Irish Navy is waiting for them to come back in the port. They intercept the boat, they raid it, they take all the weaponry over a million dollars worth of stock seven tons of assorted weapons explosives body armor anything that the ira could use to wage their war against the british army was now intercepted and taken by the irish government and u.s navy working in conjunction with m15 secret police who sean o'callaghan was an informant for they arrest the crew the valhalla crew sails back across the atlantic um don't believe they fished at all so i don't know what their story was when they came back but they were detained they came back to boston before they steamed back home port to gloucester they were detained by u.s customs uh mcintyre bob anderson and the rest of the crew they are all held grilled questioned intensely for almost uh, I, it was definitely over 12 hours i don't think it was a 24 hour period but it was a long time they just drilled these guys grilled them the only thing that they could find in the boat the was one shell only one piece of ammunition i don't know how out of all the seven tons of stuff that they brought over there one little shell of ammunition ended up falling out they found that they questioned and grilled them uh they certainly knew what they did they they knew that the valhalla brought stuff across the ocean and offloaded on the marita and the marita and got caught but they didn't have any physical evidence to hold them with so after they grilled them and their stories checked out systems agents had to let them go so like I previously stated, this had nothing to do with an FBI investigation or a U.S. Customs investigation. This was not uh, a tip that John Connolly got from Whitey Bulger. John McIntyre was not working with the authorities when the Valhalla, the Valhalla steamed out of Gloucester. This was from an IRA defector, Sean O'Callaghan, who was working with the British M15 secret police. And 
the Merida Inn was seized. They took all the, the arsenal that was on board. They arrested the guys on board. Apparently, there was a New Yorker who was an ex-Marine named John Crawley who was in Ireland. He got arrested by our Irish authorities on uh, charge of smuggling. He was part of this whole um, conspiracy with the IRA and the gun running. But as far as the guys on the American end, they were pretty much got off scot-free. Joseph Murray, Patrick Nee, Whitey Bulger, even... The guys who were on the boat, the captain Robert Anderson and John McIntyre and the rest of the crew, after they were held and grilled by custom agents for hours on end, they were released and probably nothing would have come of it because they didn't have any physical evidence tying to them. And like I said, this was an investigation that was being led on the other side of the pond. The American authorities weren't as interested in it as the British and Irish authorities were. So... Most likely that would have been the end of the story as far as the American side of things. But two months after the seizure happened in November of 1984, John McIntyre gets picked up for drunk driving in Quincy. And this is what I, this is where I, I just, I cannot make sense of this part of the story. If there's, there's just got to be something missing because this guy, he just, starts talking about stuff that has nothing to do with anything. He starts opening up and telling about all these conspiracies, tells them all about the Valhalla, all these intricate smuggling plots that he's involved with, with Joseph Murray and other large-scale traffickers and smugglers. I mean, was the guy drunk out of his mind? He started just blabbermouthing. But at some point in these hour-long uh, interrogation interviews, you would think he would have sobered up and just shot and be like, what am I doing? So I, I don't think it could be that, that he was like that drunk, that he just was rambling drunk and talking nonsense. I mean, did the guy have some sort of underlying mental condition or something? And he had like a, like a schizo episode or something? Like, I don't understand. He got popped for drunk driving. Even if the guy had a record or was on probation, what's he going to do? A couple months? This is pre-Melanie's law where they had the really stiff penalties for drunk driving in Massachusetts after the little girl got killed and they passed the Melanie's law. This is a tree of that. I mean, the guy... He's not even going to probably, it was like a slap in the wrist in 1984 for drunk driving. The guys that were still driving around after they had almost 10 OUIs back then. So I, I just don't understand. I cannot make sense of this part of the story. What made this guy, John McIntyre, cooperate into the level that he did? He's like implicating people and things that were nothing to do with even the Valhalla and the shipment that was seized. He leads these guys on to some... Uh, what, I think it was probably the biggest seizure at the time when they found it. He starts talking to them. He's telling them all about the Valhalla. He's telling them all about this stuff. He's, he's mentioning people's names. One person's name, though, that he did not mention was he did not mention Whitey Bulger, which is, I think, is an important part. He never said him by name. He mentioned Pat Nee's name. He mentioned Joseph Murray's name. Never said Whitey Bulger's name. So, But he did start bringing up this thing that was called the Dutch Deal. Uh, so they bring in this U.S. Customs investigator, Donald DeFago, and he just starts unraveling this crazy story from this guy, John McIntyre. It's almost like, too good to believe. All right, just real quick, I got to make a tiny correction before I go further so people don't get hung up on it or don't hammer me in the comments. The guy's named John Crawley, the ex-Marine from New York that I mentioned. He wasn't part of like the Valhalla conspiracy. He was just another big ally of the IRA who is involved in this like wider smuggling conspiracy to help arm the IRA. Like Patrick Nee was a contact that they had in Boston. This guy, John Crawley was a contact they had in New York. He was arrested by Irish authorities in Ireland for smuggling, but it was part of something else. It wasn't part of the Valhalla conspiracy. Patrick Nee and Joseph Murray were in Ireland though, awaiting the Merida Ann to come back to shore with the shipment. When they got word that it had been seized by the Irish Navy, they got the heck out of Dodge as quick as they could before they got seized by Irish authorities or questioned by the British M15 police. So this guy, Donald DeFago, the U.S. Customs agent, going back to where we were with John McIntyre, this Donald DeFago guy cannot believe the stuff that he's hearing. So what at first was a simple drunk driving stop by the Quincy police has turned into something much, much bigger. I'm sure the Quincy police at first, when they get him down the station, and he's talking all this nonsense. They must have thought he was probably crazy or drunk at first. But just to be safe, they alerted U.S. Customs and higher, you know, branches of law enforcement. And this guy, Donald DeFago, the U.S. Customs agent, comes, starts interviewing him. 
and he some of the stuff he's saying is checking out there's validity to it so he starts interviewing him and starts like an official interview um you know he's talking all about the valhalla the case is already you know it's been busted in ireland the irish authorities and the british m15 police are already working that case over there but now this gives the american authorities to work the case over here to go after the guys who were putting together this massive shipment which was the biggest shipment in the history at that point um not only this, he's talking about this Dutch deal. And so DeFago starts digging deeper into this. And this is like, this is where it's really insane with McIntyre. Like nobody knew anything about this. The authorities, like, like I said, the Valhalla was doomed from even before it set sail from Gloucester. It, it had been compromised. The Irish authorities were ready to intercept it. Like that was a foregone conclusion. No matter if McIntyre cooperated after the fact or what, that would have, same, same uh, result would have happened. But nobody, the authorities had no idea about this Dutch deal or about Murray. Like, Murray was so under the radar. Uh, this guy, I'm telling you, he was, like, one of the biggest traffickers in the whole country. And he was under the radar for the longest period of time. So, as they dig deeper, they find out that this Norwegian freighter called the Romsland. And McIntyre is promising that it has one of the largest shipments that they will have ever seized in the history of, uh, of you know, narcotic seizures. Uh, it's most likely probably six months to a year's worth of supply for Murray's stuff. So they go down, they locate, yeah, in fact, the, there is a Norwegian freighter uh, under the name of Romsland. It's docked. Uh, it's this big, you know, cargo freighter. They go, they start investigating. On board, like, on the deck of the actual freighter, there's all gravel and rock and stuff, like, uh, I don't know if they were trying to, with the context of it being there, whether it was like we're transporting this gravel on the surface of the freighter. I don't know what their excuse was for having, but it, the whole top it's covered with gravel. They end up having to get a bulldozer down onto the cargo freighter. They scoop up all the gravel and loose dirt and stone that's on top. Then they realize that underneath that, there's been a layer of concrete poured so the hatches to go onto like the underneath of the boat to the bowels of the boat where the storage areas are it's all been cemented closed so now they have to bring down a big giant drill and they have to hammer drill through this like feet of concrete that they've laid they open up the hatch and what do they find in the underneath of the boat 36 tons of mary jane yeah so let that sink in for a minute. There's 2,000 pounds in a metric ton. There was 36 tons aboard this ship. So that's what I'm saying. Like This was most likely six months to a year supply for Joseph Murray to supply pretty much like the entire Northeast for a half a year to a year. I mean, these guys, I'm telling you, this guy wasn't selling dimes at the Bunker Hill projects. This guy was a kingpin. Um... He was probably doing one to two of deals like this a year to keep his supply go going. You know, this is a massive seizure. Like, the, I can't, but like, this guy, Donald DeFago, must have just been mind blown from a simple drunk driving stop and arrest. They have made like the largest seizure of Mary Jane in the history of the United States. So after the Irish Navy stops the Merida Ann and seizes the giant arsenal that the Valhalla just brought across the Atlantic Ocean and delivered to them, obviously these guys on Boston are becoming like, they're on alert. Uh, they know that the investigation started in Ireland and it was over on that side of the ocean, but they know that if they're investigating their IRA contacts over there, then they, they probably know about them. Patrick Nee was going over to Ireland on a pretty regular basis. Joseph Murray traveled over there with him as well. So they would have to know that they're probably being watched up to some degree by authorities, whether it's from over there or at home in America. So they're probably on alert to a certain degree after this happens. And I'm sure Pat Nee especially was very upset about this because this was supposed to be the shipment and probably he was probably hoping in his heart that this was going to tip the balance of the war that would help his IRA and his homeland of Ireland. Then after the U.S. Customs and the DEA boarded, 
the ROMs line and found out what was underneath the deck there and confiscated it, it set these guys into a panic. I mean, this must have almost ruined Joel Murray. This was at least six months worth of work for this guy, and it was gone. So now they're trying their, their suspicions are up. They're trying to figure out who would have intimate knowledge of this, who was weak and would rat, who would have a reason to. So, you know, they're trying to figure out and none of the key players a suspect, I don't think. You know, Patrick Knee, Joseph Murray. I don't even know if Whitey Bulger would have had intimate uh, details about the boat and where it was and stuff like that. He was getting a cut at this point from Joseph Murray, but I don't know if he would have had that kind of intimate knowledge. But they start looking at John McIntyre because he was close. He was on the Valhalla when it went to Ireland and made the drop off to the Marie Anne. He had gone to Amsterdam before with Joseph Murray. They would go there uh, ahead of time before they would make a purchase of, uh, before Joseph Murray would make a purchase of a large amount. He would go and sample some of the different products that these guys had in Amsterdam before he would make the purchase. Then they'd go back to America and await the giant shipment. So he knew that John McIntyre had very, very intimate knowledge of this. And they started to kind of hone in on him and he was probably acting suspicious at this point. He's being told by Donald DeFago in the U.S. Customs that if, you know, that he's got, they got to stay in, he's got to stay in uh, daily contact with them. They're very worried about him. That's what I'm saying. Like, what was this guy thinking when he made this decision and gave this piece of evidence up to the government? Like the implications of it. Like it's not like he was telling on his neighbor for selling a couple bags. He, I mean, this is a worldwide conspiracy involving players from different countries. The consequences of him giving this information to the government in the aftershock, if you will, because this was like an earthquake in the Boston underworld that shook everything up. And obviously these guys are going to want to find out who gave this information, eliminate that liability for trying to set them up again. And also they're going to want revenge. Joseph Murray lost millions of dollars in this deal. Probably like a year's worth of income. Set him back, probably almost ruined his business. Uh, so U.S. Customs obviously realized the gravity of the situation. John McTie probably did. He just was in denial about it. He wants to continue on living his life like nothing happened, just going to work every day. He's refusing witness protection. So U.S. Customs is saying at least you need to be in contact with us every day so we know that you're okay and you're safe. So unfortunately, though, for John McIntyre, the worst thing imaginable could have happened to him when he was being interviewed by Donald DeFego, the U.S. Customs agent. They invited an FBI agent to come sit on the interview as well because this was going to be probably one of the huge biggest seizures in the history of the United States. So obviously they include different law enforcement agencies. And back then in the early 80s, the FBI wasn't suspect. They didn't realize that they had all these leaks. It wasn't John Connolly that came and sit on the interview, but John Connolly ended up finding out about this. Um, obviously he gave word to Whitey as he always did. So unbeknownst, John McIntyre. So John McIntyre, not only is he heavily involved in the smuggling operations, he's gone to Amsterdam with Joseph Murray, but there was an FBI agent in on the interview with him when he's spilling the beans about the Ramsla and all this stuff. Obviously, Connolly didn't find out ahead of time to warn them so that they couldn't stop, you know, I don't know what they would have done. Were they going to sink the boat or head it back out to the ocean, maybe? There's no way they could have got that stuff off the boat, off board the boat, but Connolly ends up telling Whitey about it. Whitey goes to Patrick Nee and Joseph Murray and lets them know it. Connolly's telling me it's McIntyre, so they're probably already suspicious of McIntyre, but now we know, like, it's him. We need to take care of this. So they concoct a plan, probably because they figure, like, McIntyre, he's just a working fisherman. This guy has no money. So if they approach him with a proposition, Patrick Nee says to him, they know that uh, his dream is to be a captain of his own ship, that he, you know, he he's involved in this stuff, he's involved in this lifestyle, and they figure if they can hook him and find out that he can get a large sum of money, it's obviously being supplied by some government agency. So they approach him and they say, listen, we just lost a big shipment in the ROMs line, we're down, we need to get back in the game, we're short on money, is there any way that you could come up with 20 grand? If you can invest 20 grand into this next big shipment, we'll cut you in on the deal, you'll be a partner, you'll get a good percentage of the proceeds from the deal, and not only that, we're going to give you your own boat called the Surge, and you're going to be the captain, and you're going to... Uh, be in control of this whole smuggling operation in your own boat. So McIntyre is like, this is like his dream. 
Uh, I don't understand how he, I mean, he, this guy obviously is not working with a full deck from just getting himself in this whole situation to begin with, but he doesn't see that this is obviously a trap. I, that being said, I don't understand how the U.S. Customs agent, they realize that the reward for catching these guys is worth the possibility of maybe losing McIntyre. So they go ahead with this deal. Uh, they give him the $20,000. He meets Patrick Knee at a diner in South Boston, gives him the money, and this basically seals his fate. Patrick Knee uh, and Joseph Murray and Whitey Bulger, they know that John McIntyre does not have $20,000. He doesn't have access to that kind of money. And the only way that he's going to get that to fulfill his end of the investment is to get fronted by a U.S. agency, uh, whether it's the FBI, DEA, or U.S. Customs. I think that they knew exactly that he was working for the U.S. Customs. I think John Connolly gave them all this information. But then once it went through, he gave him the money. And, of course, Pat Nee is just trying to make a quick buck out of this. I, I think he divvied it up with the rest of the guys. I mean, why not take twenty grand off the top as well? So, um, but this seals the deal. They know. See, now he came up with the twenty grand. He gave us the money. And the, the U.S. Customs, they really went out looking out for John McIntyre's best interest. So the days leading up to McIntyre's disappearance in November, he's getting increasingly, increasingly nervous. He tells his mother that he thinks people are following him. His father's sick. He's older. He's like ailing. I don't know if he had cancer or something, but he's on his way out. And he, one of the last times he visited his father was like a day or two before he disappeared. And uh, he had tea with his dad. And I guess like word was starting to spread in the streets that he was uh, no good and informant and to stay away from him. The night before he disappeared, someone killed his cat and threw it at the front door of the family house. So he knew something was up. He knew that these guys um, were after him. I don't know why he didn't just disappear and beat feet. Or well, maybe, I, I don't really know. I, there's a lot of questions I have about McIntyre personally. But either way, on November 30th, 1984, Patrick and Nee picked him up, and this was the last time that McIntyre was ever seen. It's basically been accepted what happened to him. It's been corroborated by several different people. Um, Patrick and Nee and Joseph Murray picked up John McIntyre. Uh, it was under... I don't know if they were going to a house party and they were bringing him there or they were going to go do something after. And Patrick Nee said he just needed to drop something off at because they brought him to uh, Patrick Nee's. I think it was his brother's house in South Boston. It's a, it was a family member of Patrick Nee that owned that house because a lot of stuff would happen with that house later on. But that's another story. So. There's reports that Joseph Murray got dropped off beforehand, so he wasn't at the house, didn't have any any part of what ended up happening to McIntyre. But basically, they brought him to this house, said Patrick Nee even went as far as to go to the package store and buy a, a case of Miller Lite. They walk into the house, and there's no party there. It's Steve Flemmy, Kevin Weeks, and Whitey Bulger. And basically, I guess as soon as they walk in the door... Weeks just drills uh, John McIntyre, knocks him on the floor, and Whitey sets upon him, and they just start handing him a beating instantly, like on him, grilling him, asking him, you know, are you a rat? Did you talk to the authorities? Did you rat on us? You know, just um, just turns into a very scary, ugly scene right away. Now, this is where it gets like tricky with Patrick Knee and stuff like that. He ended up getting immunity with all this stuff that happened. So he claims that he just dropped um, John McIntyre off, that he never even went into the house. Other people say that he did go in the house, but he left right away. But then it's also said that as soon as McIntyre walked in the house, he started getting beaten by Kevin Weeks. So if Patrick Knee was in the house even for a moment or two, he would have seen McIntyre get attacked. So he either needs to say that he never went in the house at all, or he saw McIntyre get beaten and left after he started getting beaten. So either way, it was just an awful, terrible situation for John McIntyre. Either way, whether Patrick Knee walked into the house with him or not, it doesn't really matter because Kevin Weeks, who was just a brute back then, and Whitey Bulger just set upon McIntyre and just handed him an awful beating. 
Um, they were just trying to get information out of him. I can't get too graphic. Obviously, I don't even know if we, how YouTube's going to feel about this video anyway, so it doesn't even matter. But I'm not going to graphically describe what happened to the poor man. But basically, he admitted, yes, I did cooperate with authorities. I gave information. And he the whole thing is he never even gave whitey's name he didn't really know whitey at all i don't even know if he'd actually even met whitey prior to this experience and this guy's like this guy matt of boston who blogs a lot about boston underworld stuff from this time period and just in general uh he has a hypothesis that this is just something that might have been pinned on whitey because he really has no cause for doing this to mcintyre he didn't get ratted out by him it was patrick knee and murray that got implicated by and had the most to lose um from mcintyre so either way he ends up admitting, yes, I did work at the authorities. Um, Bulger tries to take his life um, manually. It's not working. He ends up asking McIntyre, would you like one in the head? And McIntyre replies, yes, please. And he does that. And Bulger takes care of him, puts him out of his misery. And Kevin Weeks describes this and, and gives the authorities, uh, tells them that. And it's just kind of, it's like chilling and sad at the same time. The guy basically like whimpered yes please like i just even if this guy put himself in a situation he shouldn't have been mixing with people like this and and he got himself into this dire dire situation you still can't help but just as a human being like feel sorry for this guy just what an awful awful way to go no like nobody really deserves that so he disappeared his family obviously assume the worst kind of knew because beforehand he was saying i'm being followed someone's after me so they feared the worst and assumed that he somebody you know killed him and disposed of him and he is gone nobody can find out what happened to him so for i think it was 16 17 years mcintyre just disappeared and the authorities really didn't follow it up the FBI certainly was not interested. U.S. Customs might have feigned like they were upset or whatever, but they put him out on a limb here. They they really were not, they didn't have this guy's best interest at hand. They weren't protecting him. By giving him that 20 grand to give to Patrick Knee, he was basically signing his death sentence. Not that he wouldn't have probably been killed anyways, but they weren't really looking out for this guy. So anyways, he disappears in 1999 when Kevin Weeks ends up getting arrested after Whitey Bulger fled. It all comes out that he was an FBI informant and all this and blah, blah, blah. Kevin Weeks ends up cooperating with the authorities. And, you know, a lot of people want to clown on Kevin Weeks. And they call him, you know, Kevin Squeaks and Kevin Two Weeks because it only took him two weeks before he ended up turning and cooperating with the authorities. So, of course, people love to make fun of Kevin Weeks and call him a rat and call him these nicknames. Kevin Squeaks, Kevin Two Weeks. Writers like Howie Carr love the name calling. They have a field day making fun of Kevin Weeks. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to recklessly make fun of this guy, even though there's like a multitude of reasons that he's not the hardest person to pick on. But two main reasons. A, because even though he's older, he could still probably easily give me the hands and hand me a beating. And I don't recklessly talk, run my mouth about people that could easily throw me a beating. So that's the first reason. But the second and more important reason is because even though that he was involved with Whitey Bulger and did these terrible things, and though he says he never committed actual murder, he was always there. He helped move the bodies. He helped bury them. Um, implicated in all sorts of crimes. Even though he did all this, and then he ended up becoming an informer, which in the underworld is like the one of the worst things you could possibly be, even though so many people do it at this point. Even though all these negative things about this guy, the fact that he led authorities to these bodies in 2000 and showed where some of these graves were and let these families finally have some peace and like a resolution to their suffering and their, their wondering and their questions of what had really happened, where are you know our loved ones, our family members. He gave these families peace. And in my opinion, of course, this is just opinion, you know, this is the least he could do for being, you know, as an ex at least at the very least an accessory to these murders to give these families some peace because for decades they've suffered in silence and wondered like where their loved ones really are, what really happened to them. And so, if nothing else, the guy got my respect by doing that. Um, I don't know. Like I said, there's a lot of things you could pick on him for, and it's really easy, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I will say that he did do a service to these families by finally giving them an answer to their questions that they had for decades. 
So unfortunately for John McIntyre, he met a terrible fate as a consequence of him working with the U.S. government and giving U.S. Customs the information to board the Romslon and have that huge seizure and put Joe Murray basically almost out of business. So that was his consequence. And as being part of this wider conspiracy with the Valhalla and the Romslon, Joe Murray, Patrick Nee, and Bob Anderson would end up going to trial Patrick Nee and Bob Anderson, as smaller players, would be sentenced to seven years in prison. They only ended up doing about four. Joseph Murray was sentenced to ten because he was considered like the main player in this conspiracy since he really was. He was the main trafficker. But he ended up not going to prison because in a domestic dispute, I made a video about this in the past, in a domestic dispute with his wife, he ended up getting killed in his own cabin in Maine. So he never went to prison for it. But they've, I guess they ended up paying Bob Anderson $10,000. But yet again, uh, what kind of choice does this guy really have? Like he, They asked him if he wanted to captain the Valhalla. What was he going to say? No, he probably would end up disappearing. So he got kind of semi-forced into that. Obviously, every man has a choice. He could have said no. You know, he did, he did have, it wasn't like he didn't have a choice. He could have, but he made that decision. Although it was under certainly stressful situations. Like, I don't know what else anybody else would have done. But also they said, hey, will you take the fall and not, you know, give any information to the government and not cooperate and just plead guilty and take the fall. We'll pay you $10,000. And what's he going to do? No, I'm not going to take the $10,000. i am going to cooperate with the government. He would have been a dead man. So he ended up doing that. He went to prison, although only for four years. It's still, the guy was not a criminal. He was a working fisherman. So anybody being taken out of that life and put in prison for four years who's never done a day in jail in their life, that's a culture shock. And believe me, it would have been quite a punishment. And his life was basically ruined. This guy was a legit, successful commercial fisherman. My mother, who knows everything that happens on this side, of the bridge I asked her because she's around the same age and she said oh yes I remember Bobby Anderson he was very nice he was a gentleman very handsome um, he was from Gloucester but he moved to Rockport with his first wife and they bought a house she even knew the street that the guy it's unbelievable my mother and my nan god rest her soul the, the information that they know about other people it's scary and this is before the internet when you can look this stuff up they just know all the stuff it's processed some way way back but so obviously either way it was just a life-changing event for Robert Anderson and not in a positive way going to prison even though it's only for four years it still must have been an awful experience for him his reputation was like never the same in Gloucester I don't know if he was able to captain ships again or what he did to support himself after the fact but like I said it would totally change the trajectory of his life getting involved with these guys and the consequences Joseph Murray never went to prison because he got his life taken at the hands of his own wife Patrick Need did the four years in prison and then almost like as soon as he got out he got rearrested for um, an armed robbery and went away for Nine years, and I think Whitey Bulger might have had something to do with that. Whitey Bulger just wanted Patrick Knee away from him, and after he got out of prison in the early 90s, um, Patrick Knee stopped dealing with Whitey Bulger. And I'm not going to talk too much about um, like that time period in Southie or go too much in depth about Kevin Weeks and stuff that involved these guys because I think that's stuff that needs to be done in a future video. I certainly am going to talk about um, Arthur Bucky Barrett, and that's why I did not mention him at all in this video because I'm going to talk about that stuff in future episodes because it's good material um so i hope you guys enjoyed this video i apologize i feel like i rambled a lot in this video and it is extremely long so if you are at this point and you're still watching thank you so much i just i had a real i can't lie guys i had a hard time recording this video i must have erased and re-recorded so i i can't even i can't even count the amount of times I've raced and re-recorded on this, just from the uh, success of that video from uh, I made a couple weeks ago, the original Black Gangsters of Boston, it's like at 80 something thousand views right now. And I've gotten like a thousand subscribers in the past week. So of course, thank you so much. I am, it's like surreal, I am so grateful. But it rattled me a little bit and like I don't know why when good things like that happen, it's like, it just shook me up a little bit and I think I've had a little bit of a hard time recording this video and I was really looking forward to doing this video so I hope I didn't just complete butcher it and I hope you guys have enjoyed it and like I said guys thank you so much for the overwhelming amount of support that I've gotten from that video um, my new subscribers welcome my old subscribers thank you so much for being with me I finally I got a payment from YouTube and from Google AdSense it's just like 
What an amazing journey and ride this has been so far. And it's really only beginning. I'm only six months into this. So thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I didn't, <laughs> like I said, ruin it. I'll try to get back to form and not be so uh, I, on my rants and rambles like I did on this video, unfortunately. So hit that like button, please, still, if you can. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. But you know, most importantly, guys, like I always say, make good choices, make good decisions. Take good care of yourselves, your family, your loved ones, fellow human beings. Try to have a great day. God bless, guys. I will talk to you soon.